Okay, hello everyone. Thank you very much for joining. Um, welcome to the October 2021 CMMID seminar. Today we are delighted to be joined by Dr. Pierre Nouvellet, who is a reader in evolution, behaviour and ecology at the University of Sussex and a visiting reader at Imperial College London. Pierre's research interests sit at the interface between ecology and epidemiology, and his research focuses on developing statistical methods to estimate parameters within complex ecological settings to better understand the dynamics of disease transmission and to mitigate their public health risk. Pierre is part of the COVID-19 team at Imperial College London and has been working on COVID-19 since March of 2020. Today, Pierre is going to talk about short-term forecasting of COVID-19, considering the data sources that are available and trying to make sense of signals to predict the short-term incidence of deaths, characterize transmission in relation to mobility and to interpret figures related to testing. Thank you so much, Pierre, for agreeing to speak today. So the talk itself will last around 40 to 45 minutes, after which we'll have time for some questions. So if you're in the audience, please post your questions in the Q&A box during the talk, and we'll try our best to get through them all before the seminar closes at 12.45. Without further ado, let's begin the seminar. Pierre, over to you. The floor is yours. Thanks for the introduction, um, So, and thanks for the invitation. Uh, so I'll be presenting a little bit of, uh, well, a couple of projects that I've been working on on COVID-19 and um, yeah, I said it would be best to just have a pretty vague title and just attempting to make sense of some number, I guess is, uh, is um, what I must say I've been struggling to do um, over the past year and a half. And um, so I should say that the work's been conducted as part of the Imperial COVID-19 team. And, and in particular, I want to highlight Sangita right here and Corey Neil Ferguson and Crystal Donnelly, with whom I've uh, mostly been working. Um, I'll just give a little bit of background about uh, myself. So I have a PhD in quantitative biology. Um, I've been working on ants behavior, um, chasing better and trying to count them. And so in some sense, uh, it was all very much um, mathematical biology and uh, moved towards epidemiology uh, at Imperial and then uh, back at Sussex focusing on statistical epidemiology and uh, transmission dynamic in various settings. So NTDs, wildlife, and, and more recently, well, more recently in emerging disease and rapid response, really since, um, since MERS coronavirus and then Ebola, Zika, and, and macro 19 So um, a brief overview of the, uh, of the seminar today, I'll talk about short-term forecast of uh, SARS-CoV-2. Um, and I'll present some of the results we had about global forecast of, um, of tests, short-term forecast of tests uh, across the world. I'll talk a bit about mobility and transmission, so trying to understand a little bit better what is driving um, transmission of SARS-CoV-2. Um, the last... Yeah, so another bit that I would like to present is uh, some recent work we've been involved trying to estimate the transmission advantage of new variant of concern. And, and if I have time, try to talk a little bit about uh, testing and assessing the reporting of uh, SARS-CoV-2 and COVID-19. But I'm not quite sure that I'll be able to cover that bit. Um, so, oops, sorry. So I don't think I need to introduce too much of COVID-19, but they have a huge uh, influence on the world and still has, uh, with close to 5 million deaths uh, recorded as of, I think that was yesterday, uh, I took the slide from the WHO dashboard. So a very widespread uh, spread of the, of the disease, obviously. And, um, and so since, um, since the beginning, around March 2020, that is, um, We've been involved in doing short-term forecast of SARS-CoV-2 globally. And uh, so I'll just briefly talk about the model, um, but I won't go in too much detail. We can discuss it later. So what we did for our short-term forecast was to use three different models and 
combine the output to produce ensemble forecast and the forecast include forecasting future tests uh, as well as the, the measure of the work production number um, to, uh, at any time and, and across the world. Um, so briefly about the model, uh, we've got two models that are really based on estimating the reproduction number. Um, so as you probably know, if you have information about uh, deaths in the past, so this is deaths plotted here against time, and uh, this dotted line uh, indicate where we are now. So if we have information about past incidents and information about the generation time uh, of the disease, we can use uh, what is called the renewal equation that tells us that the death at any point is, is, is a function of the transmissibility of the pathogen um, multiplied by a, a weighted sum of, of, of the previous deaths and, and the weighting is linked to the generation time. Um, and, and we can put this into a statistical framework uh, by assuming, for example, here that the number of deaths at time t uh, is following a Poisson distribution with the mean as indicated uh, as before. And so this sort of framework uh, allows us to estimate the reproduction number over time. And um, if we make the assumption that the reproduction number will stay similar to what uh, it was at the last time point, uh, we can forecast the number of deaths uh, in the future. It's a very strong assumption, which I want to highlight again. So those kind of forecasts assume that the transmissibility is going to remain as it is seen, say, today. Um, and so that way, we can make forecast of the number of deaths uh, in the future. So we developed sort of two methods. Well, those methods have been developed um, even previous to uh, COVID-19, really. So uh, two methods that are based on this sort of general framework. In the first method, uh, what we try to do is rely on the past deaths uh, and assuming a, a time window for which, a recent time window for which the uh, transmissibility uh, remain constant. And uh, so in this first method, we try to optimize this time window um, to forecast in the future. So we have a look at the past forecast and try to find the best time window that allows us to uh, correctly reconstruct the incidence and trend in the reproduction number. And, and then once we've chosen this optimal time window, we can use this latest estimate of the reproduction number to forecast in the future for the number of deaths. Uh, the second method, um, we use a sort of fixed time window, but we try to reconstruct the incidence prior to this time window. So, so you can see in this curve, we've got like the incidence of deaths, and, and in a sort of lighter red here, we reconstructed the sort of exponential um, past incidence of deaths. And this allows us, we believe, to um, account a little bit more for potential changes in, in the reporting, in this case, reporting of deaths, and, and be a little bit more flexible about uh, what is the current transmissibility that best um, explains the data. Uh, so it's a lot of I'm sure you're not going to have a lot of light in my office as well. Um, the third model uh, rely more on a statistical framework, I suppose, uh, and we call this death case model. So uh, briefly, if we plot numbers here against time, in green, we have the number of cases. In red, we have the number of deaths. Obviously, um, deaths occur with a delay, and this delay is represented by delta. So if we wanted to look at the ratio between number of cases and number of deaths, uh, what we first do is account for this delay. So basically, uh, in some way, shift 
and this red curve to, toward the left. And so we can relate the number of cases to the number of deaths, and this gives us this ratio, small r, uh, which we can uh, think of as a, a sort of observed um, CFR in a way. And um, so once we've characterized this ratio, we can assume that the, the latest estimate of the ratio is going to remain true. And therefore, given the number of cases observed in, uh, in the recent day, we should be able to make some inference on how many deaths we'll expect in the week to come, just based on the number of cases that have been seen. Uh, and so that's what we uh, use as a test case model to make a forward prediction. I should say that once, once we've made those prediction of uh, future best, we can use sort of standard framework based on the neural equation to also get an estimation uh, of the transmissibility at any time point. So briefly commenting on, um, on the work we've been doing, we've been doing weekly reports, um, reporting on the trend across various countries with uh, sustained transmission of SARS-CoV-2. Um, about 70 countries included in, the, in some of the latest reports. Um, we've been releasing those um, forecasts since uh, quite early on, since the 8th of March, on a weekly basis. I think there were like a couple of weeks uh, we took as holiday, but probably three or four. Um, and, and this been contributing as well to other forecasting effort, uh, like the Bright Lab in, in the US uh, and the CDC and the European COVID-19 Forecast Hub, uh, which is led by uh, Sebastian Punkett at, at the London School. Um, so those forecasts have been available since the 8th of March on, on this link, um, and, and we've been also working um, with, uh, with partner Tormed and Halsmap to uh, visualize in, in a little bit more intuitive way. So this is the initial sort of website that we have, which uh, in some ways is a little bit uh, ugly, I suppose, but, uh, but is informative. And, and so we're working with ProMed and HealthMap to, one, try to make the most of the data that they collect, which is more um, digital surveillance of infectious disease, and, and also try to uh, have tools that are available, like this uh, website that we built um, that gives us the number of cases there, and, and you can to go to change for projected this and, and things that across the world. Um, now a little bit on, we've been working, well, quite a bit actually on trying to retrospectively assess the predictive ability of, of, of this kind of model, um, which is quite important and, and probably not, not quite, not enough done as it was uh, forecasting is already difficult. So it takes a lot of time to also retrospectively assess the ability of, of those models. And, um, and so it's really important for science communication, I suppose, that, that we engage a lot more in those kind of retrospective assessment. Um, <clears throat> so here is for three countries. Uh, we plotted a daily deaths um, across time uh, for three countries. Uh, so the black dots are, are the observed data. You can see quite a, a noisy pattern, especially in Brazil, where there is a sort of weekly, uh, very strong pattern because of reporting. Um, so Brazil here, India, Italy, where uh, you can see a big wave in Brazil, in India, and then two waves in Italy. And I think this is extending to about uh, February 2021. And, and at the bottom, our estimate of the reproduction number trend over time. So that's a weekly estimated reproduction number uh, over time. And overlaid on, on this graph, we also have in green um, the weekly forecast uh, that we've been making. And so visually, um, I guess we do relatively well. Sometimes we are quite a way off. So you can see in Italy at the very beginning, 
we might have overshoot quite a lot uh, what the incidence of death was. Having said that, those situations are very difficult to handle when you have a very high incidence, and it's very difficult to predict when intervention, very drastic intervention like a lockdown, are going to be implemented and drastically change the dynamic of, uh, of transmission. Um, oops, that doesn't show very well. Um, so, in order to sort of characterize the quality of our forecast, we had a look at the mean relative error across week for all of the country. And uh, so you can see a, a sample of the country here, uh, which is sort of representative of, um, of, of how well we've been doing. So sometimes we do extremely bad. That's when uh, the mean relative error is greater than two in blues there, twice in Ecuador, in Nigeria. So there's places where sometimes we do very bad. Typically, when the error is, is the mean relative error is less than one, uh, I would consider that we are doing relatively well. Um, just as a point of comparison, Within a week, you've seen that there were quite a lot of noise in, in the data, and typically this mean relative error will be uh, close to one. So anytime we are below one, in some way we are doing better than uh, the error leading to the reporting in the data. Um, <clears throat> one way to be a little bit more stringent about the way we uh, assess the ability of our model is to compare our model to a model that has no growth. So like last week is exactly the same as this week. You can see that if you do this comparison, in some way we do well sometime, and at other points uh, we do a lot less well. Uh, so in, in those kind of instance in Canada, around the summer uh, 2020, that would be. Um, well, actually in some way to the, the ratio of the two error is uh, above one, meaning that um, a model that would have considered that we would have the same number of deaths as last week would have performed equally well, if not better than, than our approach. Um, I mean, in some way, it's not too surprising in that for a long period of time, for example, in Canada here, the incidence was pretty flat. and. Um, and therefore, uh, a model with no growth is, is probably always going to be as good as a, as a model um, where we try to estimate the transmissibility. And, and of course, it's easy to say that retrospectively, there were no growth. And uh, the advantage of our model is that it can uh, predict whether or not there would be no growth. And you can see that in Canada here, um, the mean relative error wasn't that big anyway. So, okay, it's possible that the no growth model would have performed better, but um, without knowledge of this sort of stable phase, uh, our model performed pretty well uh, still. Um, we've also tried to make um, longer term predictions or maybe medium term prediction, trying to have a look at four week prediction, three week prediction. Um, going beyond that, uh, we found that um, our model didn't perform that well. So we stopped. Um, we believe that after four weeks, the, the prediction lose um, a lot of their um, interest, I suppose. So in order to make those long, longer term predictions, just very briefly, we used a very simple heuristic. We checked for how long the transmissibility has been uh, consistent, and we try to optimize. So we weight differentially as a transmission, so putting a higher weight on recent reproduction number and a lower weight on older uh, reproduction number. And, and we try to optimize this weight uh, in real time. And, and we also attempt to account for the depletion in susceptible. So given the number of deaths that have been observed in the past, we can get a rough estimate of um, <coughs> the level of immunity uh, in the population. This is obviously having a huge assumption on uh, reporting of deaths. And obviously, in a lot of places, the reporting of deaths is not that good. And 
So it would be probably a, a pretty big underestimation of the level of immunity in many cases. Um, so when we do those kind of longer term prediction, you can see here for the one week ahead, the same figure as before, two week ahead, we are a little bit, we, we're not doing as well as before. Uh, we still think that four weeks ahead, there is still some value in doing those forecasts. Uh, obviously, when we start making some error around two weeks, so in this case in the US early on, uh, the error during this week was to make another prediction of the, of the growth. And then, and then you can see that three weeks ahead and four weeks ahead, this sort of error is, uh, is, is, is it's becoming bigger and bigger and influence more and more weeks. So this is highlighting some of the challenge uh, in, in, in making forecast in the situation, especially the early part and, and the fast growing um, period. Um, so that's all and well, I suppose. Uh, what, one, thing, one thing that we thought was important is, is perhaps to quantify our predictive ability, not so much in terms of mean relative error, which is um, somehow difficult to translate for policy maker maybe, and uh, have some things that is uh, a little bit more um, understandable. Um, so here, I plot the forecasted reproduction number against the retrospective uh, reproduction number. So this is calculated using what actually happened. And, and instead of uh, looking directly at the estimate of the reproduction number, trying to make some classification, can we accurately predict that the epidemic was either growing, likely growing, definitely decreasing, likely de decreasing, or, or we weren't quite sure about it. And so if we were perfect uh, at forecasting those kind of category, uh, then, then we would get 100% in, in the diagonal here. And, and in fact, we're not, we're not doing too bad, I suppose, uh, at least in a one week ahead. When, when the epidemic is likely growing as retrospectively uh, assessed, then um, most of the, that, that's where we, we do worse. And most of the error we do is, uh, is that we, we had classified the epidemic as being um, sort of indeterminate in, in where it was going. So too much uncertainty for, for us to, um, to decide. But, but generally speaking, uh, we do relatively well at classifying the, uh, the stages of the epidemic in a way. And we can do that one week ahead. And you can see it here, the same figure, but for four weeks ahead. And still four weeks ahead, we, uh, we are able to give some information on on the likely trend of the epidemic pretty well. Um, yeah. So in terms of uh, general conclusion uh, for this part, we, we developed a very simple approach uh, to, to, to make prediction. And uh, it was developed in, in this sort of very simple approach to a low global analysis. So to track what was happening in multiple country and, and make this assessment repeatedly over time. So the, there's a low data requirement for the sort of workflow that we have. So we only need uh, reported deaths, information on, on the generation time, and information on the cases reported. Um, but, but in some sense, the, the methodology, to some extent, account for change in, in reporting, change in implementation of control measure, uh, albeit with delay. Um, and that allows us to have those kind of consistent and repeated forecast uh, over a long period of time. Um, everything has been, well, we, we've tried as much as possible to automate the framework. Uh, so there is some initial check to be done about, um, about the input data, um, which uh, we don't really manage to get rid of, because a lot of people would be aware forecasting uh, is still, still a lot, still need those kind of manual checks. So, um, but but once this is done, when the data are sort of clean, the whole framework is run in, a, in about an hour, uh, and then we can we could release the, the forecast within an hour. We still go through a through a formal sort of peer review check within within our group, so we give 
people kind of ever look at them and try to spot any sort of strange behavior and fix it. Um, and so, yeah, like I said, this general framework we believe is, is useful in, in allowing this sort of continuous, this continuity in, in, in the prediction in a sort of um, um, standardized way. And so we managed to get many countries over a very long period of time, uh, a sort of monitoring of what are the trends in transmissibility. <clears throat> we believe that the, the framework is useful because it's also applicable to um, to any sort of other infectious disease. Um, so that's quite practical in a way. It's not uh, it, because we have such a simple approach in a way, uh, we can apply it to other infectious diseases. It's not, it's not too much linked to the mode of transmission or, or the interventions that are implemented, etc. cetera. Um, we managed to get relatively accurate prediction two, three weeks ahead, maybe four weeks ahead. Um, and long-term prediction also now can account for, uh, to some extent, for some level of herd immunity. And we managed to see that in some countries, it's, it's made a difference. Um, a lot of countries had, had very low uh, level of herd immunity anyway, but, uh, but, but so the model can account for a little bit of that. And, and it was applying in places like Mexico and Peru, where we could see some decrease linked to herd immunity. I should say that, that even if it wasn't accounting explicitly for that, because we constantly estimating the reproduction number, to some extent we do account for this depression in susceptible um, in a sort of um, statistical way. Okay, moving on. Um, so we've we've developed this very simple. Uh, framework for the forecast, but we also wanted to understand a little bit more the driver uh, of transmissibility early on. And uh, one, one of the one of the biggest trends that we've seen early on was this um, sort of decrease in mobility. Uh, so here I've plotted over time the uh, the measure of mobility, and so I believe that's apple mobility. So the check like where you're moving on when you are on your phone, Google at, at similar uh, measure of mobility. And um, you can check against the baseline, say pre-pandemic level, um, which would be at 100% here. And, and you can quickly see that in March, that's for the UK, uh, we saw a, a very sharp decline in, in, um, in mobility. Um, so that's personal behavior as well as um, as intervention, governmental intervention, like the lockdown uh, towards the end of March. And, and then the mobility remained uh, pretty flat for a long period of time. Uh, if I plot it further on, then we start uh, retrieving the mobility and we probably now at a level that is similar to pre-pandemic level. Um, so one of the things we wanted to do was to understand how mobility was driving, um, mobility as a sort of proxy for contact was driving um, changes in, in transmissibility. Sorry. So, so what we did is uh, gather those kind of Apple mobility data and try to correlate the transmissibility of a prediction number to the digital measure of mobility as a proxy for contact rates. Uh, so very briefly, the, the framework around this analysis, uh, we have data around mobility here. So a baseline, pre-pandemic, and sharp decline. Quite often you see a, a rebound and people start moving back again. Um, the data we're using is this uh, curve in red, the so deaths observed over time. Uh, obviously, what we use the desk because we believe the deaths are reporting in a more um, systematic way. Uh, there is a lot of issue with infections that are reported in terms of testing, given a huge variation in, in uh, reporting probability. Uh, so we use a we use a desk in, in our model, but what we're really interested in is the new infection. So again, there is a sort of delay we can reconstruct in a way. In, the new infection at any time t given the best observed at the uh, t plus the delay. Um, and, and we can use a parametric relationship to link the mobility 
to the uh, reproduction member. So mobility is linked to the reproduction member at a time t. And if we apply a delay, we can get what, what, what we expect to measure in terms of reproduction number if it was measured from the text, so sort of delayed reproduction number. Um, and, and, and this is all linked into a sort of likelihood framework. From, from the number of deaths, we can use the APS team package, which, um, which was developed to estimate reproduction number of the time. Uh, and so if we have information on, on the serial interval, then we can use a new test and get some kind of non-parametric estimate of the reproduction number and try to compare that to our parametric estimate. Um, I hope this is fairly clear. You may get a little bit clearer as I go on. So just to put this into a little bit more of equation form, uh, this parametric relationship between mobility and reproduction number, we assumed a log linear form. So the log of the reproduction number is linked to this mobility measure, basically, and the basic reproduction number. And then, so once we have this reproduction number of time t, we can estimate the reproduction number as it would be measured from death. So accounting for the delay between infection and death. And then we can link all of this into a likelihood, in this case, negative binomial distribution, and say that the number of deaths we observe is linked to the reproduction number of deaths, which depend on mobility, and the deaths in the past in some kind of other dispersion. So it's all a, a sort of stochastic uh, model of linking mobility to a prediction number to observe death. So um, a little bit on the result, we uh, run the analysis a lot of time, I suppose. I'll first present the initial, um, the initial sort of final results as they were submitted actually for publication in May, 2020. So like I said, this is for the UK. Uh, we've seen huge decrease in mobility. Um, we try to link that and to the reproduction number at time t, so that's in red here. Using a delay, we can link it to reproduction number that would be linked to test in blue here. And we could compare that to a sort of non-parametric um, estimate that is just uh, given by a PST in, in black here. And we can see that our model that link mobility to, um, to transmissibility is, is tracking very well the non-parametric. And, and I should highlight that the, the model here is estimating two parameters on the basic population number and the link between mobility and transmissibility, as opposed to the method with APS team, which is effectively measuring, estimating our production number for every uh, single week. So a lot more parameter. And here I've plotted um, the proportion of reduction in movement against the reproduction number. So visualize this uh, relationship. And you can see this sort of exponential decline, which is fixed by the model, uh, whereby the transmissibility decreases as, a, as people start moving less and less. And overlay on top of that, the error bar for um, the equivalent estimate from APS. So, so we believe that we were tracking very well uh, variation in transmissibility by, by using the um, mobility measure. So much so that uh, at, the, at, at the time we were also using those mobility measure. So if we know what the mobility now, we can measure what is the transmissibility right now and make some prediction on what will be the test in, in, in the future week to come. So in a kind of embedding the mobility into a forecasting uh, existence. However, what happened, um, as, as it became clear after, is mobility started uh, increasing again. So that's um, the, the same analysis, but uh, in January 2020. So mobility increased again. Um, and, and then what we saw was a change in the relationship between mobility and, um, and transmission, which was sort of already a little bit apparent in May, not for the UK, but for places like Germany, it was already a little bit apparent. 
And that means in our new framework, we can also estimate when is the time point, when did this relationship between transmissibility and um, mobility change. So for the UK it was somewhere around uh, end of May or second half of May. And, and really what, what we believe is, is happening there is people start moving more, uh, but they move differently from before. So they still don't have as many contacts as they used to, even, even so they are, they are moving as much as before. Um, another thing that is uh, likely to happen is that people uh, at this time um, had kept socially distance even if they moved. Um, so stay in outdoors places, uh, wearing of masks, was um, also much more prevalent at this time with masters uh, have, have stopped. So people can move more, but without increasing transmissibility. And that's very apparent here for the first phase, but the sharp decline between transmission and mobility. And uh, after May, um, increase in, in, in mobility, but we didn't see the transmission increase as much as, uh, as we used to. Um, so the, we, we, we did this analysis for the, for, for the UK, but uh, also for every country where we had available data, so available data on deaths, available data on uh, mobility as well. Um, and you can see here for Europe, uh, during, say, the first phase, um, pretty much for every country in Europe, the transmissibility decrease with, uh, with mobility reduction. Um, in the second wave, sort of after May, roughly, uh, in a lot of countries, you know, the relationship is no longer significant. That means uh, for the first half, you had a clear relationship between mobility and transmissibility. In, in the second half, so sort of after the first wave, the link between mobility and transmissibility is a lot less clear. And that's a pattern that we can see in, in Africa, in Latin America, well, the Americas, and, and Asia as well. Uh, so the first wave, we have a very clear pattern in every country where mobility and reproduction are very much linked. Second wave, not so much uh, for the reason that, probably for the reason that I highlighted before. Um, another thing that uh, is, is probably worth mentioning is that um, out of those graphs here where we put transmissibility again reduction in movement, um, we, we can, one, one of the interesting points is, is the point where the prediction cross uh, the one threshold value. So if transmissibility is below one, we expect the epidemic to decrease and, and to some extent have some control actually. Uh, so this framework allowed us to estimate what was the reduction movement that would be necessary to, um, to achieve control really. And um, like I said before, uh, we've seen that pre, uh, during the first wave and after the first wave, it's quite likely that the threshold in mobility reduction has been changing. So in the UK, uh, by achieving a 50% reduction in, in mobility in the first wave, uh, we were able to achieve some good level of control. Um, the same level of control could have been achieved by about 20% reduction in mobility in the second wave. So much lower level of mobility reduction required. Uh, and like I said, most likely again to um, people behaving very differently after the second week. And so again, we see similar patterns for uh, every country where the first one in green, you need high level of mobility reduction. After the first wave, lower level of reduction are required. In terms of general conclusion for this mobility analysis, we found a very strong correlation uh, between transmission and mobility. And in fact, initially, so let's say for the first wave, the mobility explained about three quarters of the variation in, in transmission during the first wave. Um, and then we observe this sort of decoupling or dampening of the, of the correlation between transmission and, and mobility. 
and and then around the second wave, so say from the summer 2020 onward, uh, mobility is, is now expanding around a third of the variation in the population numbers. It's still a, a useful to make prediction, but a, a lot less useful than what it was during, during the first wave. So, like I said, uh, it initially we were quite excited that it was allowing a good prediction of of um, level of restriction required to achieve control, but but obviously that was with a accounting for changing in behavior and dynamic of the disease, and we've seen this very strong decoupling of the relationship um, that is probably reflecting alternative control measure and compliance to social distancing uh, while increasing mobility. And, and again, I, I want to highlight that this, this makes it quite difficult uh, to use mobility um, for forecasting purpose, uh, as we see that this relationship is, is quite dynamic, really, and uh, it might vary of the kind quite dramatically. So this highlight again the sort of difficulty when when doing forecasting and and the sort of advantage of having a, a, a simple framework to to make the forecast because once you go into more complex mechanistic model uh, then you run the risk of uh, having assumption linked to those dynamics that are um, likely to change. So the third thing I'd, I'd like to talk a little bit about is, uh, is another difficulty when we just kind of forecast is, uh, is, is when we get those new variants coming in with uh, vastly different um, transmission. And, and it's really important, I guess, to be able to quickly identify those variants. Um, and that, that, that's done as we through the testing, nothing to do with the kind of work I'm doing. But, but then, once they are identified, trying to estimate as early as possible um, the epidemiological significance. Um, so yeah, as you all know, that there's been a lot of new variant of concern, the alpha, beta, gamma, and delta. I'm very glad that we have this kind of new nomenclature. Uh, I couldn't cope ever with a numerical format from before. Um, and so all of those, all of those variants of concern here appear to have increased transmissibility. And, uh, and but, but it took quite a bit of time, um, I suppose, to get reliable estimates of those uh, increased transmissibility. And so what we've been working on um, is a, a tool for real-time est estimation of those transmission advantage. So um, Anne Corey uh, from Imperial, uh, I'm sure you must have known about APS team. So this framework uh, to estimate time value reproduction number during epidemics, which are, uh, a lot of the work we're doing one way or another is related to this framework and uh, so the uh, volume equation and so on. And um, so we've been extending with Anne Corey and, and the teams that I mentioned before, uh, extending this framework to estimate the reproduction number in real time in multiple locations, and, and as well having some information about multiple variants, or so try to disentangle the temporal trend transmission and the transmission advantage of, of the various variant cross circulating. And, and um, this, this framework relies on assuming a sort of common trend for transmissibility within the location and the common transmission advantage of, of, of a given variant across location. So we're trying to pull information together and make the most of, of the information that we have available. And I'll just uh, briefly present some of the early results. So this, this hasn't been published yet, but it's been shared in, in, in a few places. Um, so it, and I'll just present the example of, of England where we clearly see um, the invasion of the alpha variant against, uh, I'm going to call it the white type variant uh, around October, January um, of this year last year. So you can see here the, the epic curve of the uh, number of cases uh, reported of the white type 
in one type in, in black and, and the uh, alpha variant in, in yellow there. And um, ju ju so this is plotted for all of the different regions in England. And uh, also a plotted dotted line here highlighting the, the different quarter um, of the time frame we're looking at. So first quarter here for sort of uh, October, early November, second quarter, November, December, January, February, February, March. Um, and you can see that the in the first quarter, the, the incidence of the alpha variant was extremely low everywhere, uh, started increasing a little bit uh, early November, so during the second quarter, and then exploded really uh, in January. <laughs> So that's all the sort of data that we are using. Uh, um, so the first thing we did was to try to estimate, the, get a naive estimate of this transmission advantage of alpha over the wine type. What we did first was to estimate the reproduction number independently per location and per variant. It was just using a PSTM and uh, get a sort of weekly or daily reproduction number for each location and for each variant. Mm -hmm. And then we can simply compute the ratio between this alpha variant and the wild estimate of the reproduction number, using the posterior distribution to account for this uncertainty that we have in the post-reproduction number. And, and so if we plot that for England, we've got the reproduction, so that's daily reproduction number uh, of the wild type on the x-axis, daily estimate of the reproduction number of the alpha variant on the y-axis here. And, and you can see, uh, so if, if, if they both have the same transmissibility, uh, we would expect um, this whole blob to be uh, on the diagonal when the reproduction number of the wild is two. Uh, that's because there is very few control measure and therefore the proportion of the alpha is also true. Uh, when there is very strong control intervention, say reproduction number of 0 0.5 for the wild, then we'd expect the alpha to have a similar uh, population number. So, so clearly uh, there is a transmission advantage. Uh, so the reproduction number of the alpha variant was always higher than that of the wild type. Uh, that include periods for which the reproduction number of the wild was even increasing. And, and this gives us a, a sort of rough estimate of what is the uh, transmission advantage. Having said that, you see that the blob over there is, is, is pretty wide. Uh, and therefore, using this sort of naive estimate, we can't rule out that actually the alpha variant has the same transmissibility as the wild variant. And, and that's because we, we're using everything independently, all of the location, all of the variant, uh, the reproduction number is estimated independently. And so, like I said, we believe that using this sort of framework where we bring the real-time estimation uh, in a single framework and we pool the information, assuming common local trend, so common reproduction number trend within the location, and the common transmission advantage across location. And so the estimate we get in, in this case, uh, so that's for what is this transmission advantage of alpha against y, it's a bit, uh, as a multiplicative factor. Um, so here is telling us that if we take information from all region and across all time, um, we, we believe that our best estimate is to say that the alpha variant is about 1.5 more transmissible than the wild by the very short confidence interval, which you can barely see here. Um, in blue here is what you would get using the naive estimate. So similar uh, ballpark estimate, but much wider confidence interval. And we believe that's because we don't pull any of the information together. So if we look at um, what, what we would have achieved in real time, if we had data only on the first quarter, then um, perhaps unsurprisingly, the incidence was extremely low for the alpha, and we wouldn't have been able to uh, estimate the transmission advantage. Um, uh, but by the second quarter, we, we were able to accurately estimate, uh, estimate the 
the transmission advantage. Uh, and this estimation remains fairly stable uh, if we use information from later dates. Um, the other thing we did was to, uh, so, so yeah, I should say that this means we could have gotten a, a very early estimation of the transmission advantage, which we could have used this if, if it was available in, at the time. Uh, I think by end of October, early November, we could have had a, an early estimate, a reliable estimate of the uh, transmission advantage, which um, I think the estimate from um, Eric Rose and, and, and Tim uh, using genetic data came really toward the end of November. So we could have, it could have been fairly, well, fairly earlier than that in, in raising the alarm about this alpha variant. Um, we can see here that uh, the estimate is very robust uh, across region. So we, we're quite confident in our estimate in that uh, we see a very similar pattern in every single region in the UK as well. And, and again, this is showing that even using a single region, we get like a very good estimate because um, we pull the information assuming this sort of common trend within a region. That's a common trend for transmissibility in the wild and, uh, and the alpha one. Okay, so, um, so we've developed this tool for delta estimation of transmissibility, takes advantage of pooling information, is applicable to multiple variants per security. So I've given an example with one variant, but we could use it for uh, two or three variants per circulating, is applicable in real time and applicable to other infections. So it could potentially be used for any uh, infectious disease where you've got a recurrence of uh, variant emergence, I suppose. Uh, and in fact, we used it for the estimation of the Delta variant in the UK, and as well as um, jointly estimating the Alpha and Beta Gamma variant transmission activity in France as well. So they are very similar. Um, so general conclusion, and I'll stop there. Um, so forecast, as we all know, is very challenging. Uh, operationally, it's very difficult. Change in, in the dynamic are very hard to, to predict, uh, like because of contextual change in intervention, new variants arising. Uh, like for example, the use of mobility measure difficult. Um, so yeah, there, there is something to be said about having a um, fairly simple model to monitor what's happening. So they're probably not the best forecasting model uh, to know exactly what's going to happen, but uh, they provide a very good um, tool to track long-term transmission trend across many places. We think there is quite a bit of value in doing so. Um, and we've developed methodologies that are a bit more context dependent. So the mobility work should highlight that, um, again, we built sort of an extension of the APST framework to have some, so it could be really any covariate. So, I mean, at, at the moment we were using with mobility, but that we could imagine also provide influencing other control intervention, for example. And it's nice because it's all embedded into this sort of well neural equation and stochastic framework and account for all the discussion. Uh, and then we've developed this sort of multi variant um, extension on APS team. So it shortly be available in the APS team package. It's been tested on simulated data and works very well in, in a lot of context. Uh, and it all it works very well because it's pulling this sort of information across time and location, and and we're quite hopeful that this will be a useful contribution to in, in other contexts to estimate transmission of new variant, uh, possibly with new variant coming for COVID, but, but also in those And um, with that, uh, I'll stop. Sorry, I, I won't have great time to talk about testing, but uh, thank you very much for listening, and I'll be happy to take any question. Thank you so much, Pierre, and I'm sure everyone can give a, a virtual round of applause. Um, so I would encourage um, audience members to put any questions you might have in the Q&A box, um, and we'll get through those before the end. But to start off with, I guess, um, a question from myself. 
kind of thinking about um, the third project you talk about where you're estimating the transmission advantage of variants and how one of the limitations there seems to be that you can't necessarily do that very soon after. But that kind of led me to think back to the earlier projects with the kind of RT estimation methods. And I wonder if they can be used as like an early warning system for when a new variant emerges, when suddenly the dynamics kind of diverge significantly from what the forecasting groups see. Mm. So I'm thinking, actually, if, if we look at the sort of epidemic curve, uh, so we've done, we've done the estimate, so try to retrospectively do the work uh, on a weekly basis. And, and basically, second, um, basically the, on, on the second week of October, we would have been able to accurately estimate transmission advantage. So, so we think that's probably the earliest thing you can do, to be honest. And, and you can see at this time, the incidence was extremely low. We're talking about, at the point that there is about 10, 15% of the circulating variant being this sort of new variant, then, then this methodology should be able to estimate the um, transmission advantage. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's possible. I don't think, basically what I'm saying is, I, I don't think the simple forecasting model would help. I think probably it's possible that more complex model, models that account for a lot of the detail of the transmission dynamic would have been able to spot something weird early on. But, but as far as those kind of general framework go, um, I'm pretty confident that the, the sort of new multivariant APS, you know, I'm going to call it for now, uh, it, it's going to perform extremely well. Yeah, and, and, and early on those estimates, would they have had, you know, would they have been quite uh, good estimates even early on, or would, and would they have had quite yeah, so, large so errors? Basically, ever? initially, initially for the first quarter, sort of, uh, the, the whole of October, so the yeah, the whole of October, we wouldn't have been able. Yeah, I should have said it was a second week of November. Um, the, pretty much the whole of October, we too much uncertainty. But but then then the first significant estimate of a transmission of Atlantic was not really biased. So mm. it, it's more like we get a fairly good estimate. And, and then gradually the confidence interval are decreasing. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Information. Thank you. Uh, so we've got a question from Yang. Um, Yang is asking regarding the COVID 19 outbreak forecasting, who's your target end user and have your team engaged with them in the design of the analytical process, e.g., the outcomes likely increasing, decreasing? Are they considered quite intuitive to practitioners? Um, so the, the target audience, to some extent, is um, it's a bit of a mixed bag, really. I mean, we, we, we try to provide a sort of monitoring tool, so it, it can be like quite of a broad audience, and uh, also public health practitioners within, uh, within country that are trying to track the, what's happening within their country. So it's, it's, it's fairly broad, really, uh, sort of target audience. Um, so, so yeah, we, we had a lot of feedback um, from the target audience. Possibly, I, I will take it that we didn't do such a great job in, in engaging with the target audience during the COVID-19 pandemic. But that kind of work we've been doing for many uh, years before in the context of other outbreak. And, uh, and there, and, and there we had a lot of uh, feedback. So I mentioned this project where this PROMED and house map, and as part of that, uh, we've been doing a lot of engagement with um, public health practitioners in, in various countries to get their input about what they are looking for in forecasting and what would be useful. So we, we did engage quite a lot with them in the past. And, and we've been in contact with a lot of them uh, over the, the, the last year who contacted us to uh, get sort of retrospective data, get the data downloaded for them and uh, explain a little bit of some of the trends that we were seeing. Uh, so still it's been, it's been a lot of interaction uh, around this. 
Um, I'll take the point that sometimes it feels that um, there's a sort of limited use for those forecasts, but I, I think they should be seen as a, as a sort of general process of informing the uh, state of the epidemic globally and within a country try to get some rough idea of where the, where the epidemic is going. Thank you. And there's um, a question from an anonymous attendee who's asking, do you believe it's feasible to construct a mobility informed behavioral model and incorporate it into mechanistic or semi-mechanistic models for both scenario analysis and forecasting tasks? Do you know of any examples of that in the literature? And so I think, I think quite a few people have used those mobility for forecasting. In some sense, what I'm my experience of it is, is yeah, we, we need to be quite careful because of those changing dynamics. There's no reason why we couldn't use them. Um, I would say that, so in some sense, we use mobility as a proxy for contact. And, and, and as it turns out, um, perhaps it's not the best um, proxy. But, but if we had more information, so if we can accumulate information about the relation between mobility and, and contact and character is like in any sort of dynamic, there's a strong reason why we couldn't put them all together, definitely. It's just having this sort of information um, taken in a sort of dynamic way. I mean, the, the, the scale of the information available for this pandemic is, is huge, to be honest. And sometimes it's difficult to get all of those numbers together because there's another level of information, I suppose. But, um, but at the same time, if we're going to be doing forecasts for a number of countries, you need to have all of this information for every country and sort of collect it in a standardized way. And that's, that's still very difficult. I don't think we are quite there yet. But I mean, it's really, um, really encouraging that we can use this information. Definitely. Um, we have a nice comment from Sikelo Delamini. I hope I've pronounced your name right. Um, their comment is saying, thank you very much for the informative presentation. Um, can we have a follow-up meeting with you, Pierre, to see if it's possible that you can help us with developing a model for our country? Yeah, I'd, I'd be happy to chat, um, definitely. Um, so yeah, after the talk, I suppose. And I think, yeah, sorry, yeah, go I, ahead. I think, I think it, they should, I'm not sure that my email was there in the presentation, so I can, uh, Rossi would know my email address. Yeah. Um, and then I think finally, before we close, because we've overrun a little bit, um, there's another question from an anonymous attendee. Have you ever made comparisons RE forecasting performance between these statistical approaches, renewal equations, and mechanistic models, SIR type compartmental models? Can mechanistic models be used for forecasting too? Uh, this, is, this is probably something that we're going to keep working on. I know that uh, Sebastian Frank is, is, is doing this EU forecasting program that we contribute to that and it's got a lot of model contributing to it. So um, I will I, I will probably defer to him that at some point he's, he's going to take this monumental task of, uh, of comparing the output of those different models. Uh, having said that, diversity of model is really important. So it's not like there's one good model. So we use three models and, and definitely it was useful to use three models. But if we had more models, and we could probably perform even better. So there is no one uh, one best model, I suppose. Uh, but the first thing, and then so how? I mean, we in, in with Sebastian as well. We 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 did a lot of work on forecast, including on a, a sort of challenge we had work on synthetic data and Ebola to evaluate um, forecasting ability and. Um, and, and it was shown, I think, at, at, at the time that um, simple approach like that, sort of renewal equation type model, did perform very well compared to SIR model. Having said that, if you were concentrated on, say, the UK, uh, these various group doing a um, longer term forecast using very complex model, uh, real time modeling in Imperial, they similar effort in Warwick, in London School. Uh, I mean, those models have been advising government on, on the likely future trend. And those models ultimately use a lot more information. Uh, so it's not applicable everywhere because this information is not available everywhere. 
but but those those models are actually developed from I suspect much better because um, they are developed in this sort of context framework. Um, yeah. Thanks so much. Yeah, I think it's a really nice kind of way to round up that there's lots of different models and they're good for different aspects of the pandemic and it's going to take quite some time to reflect on everything that's happened but it's very impressive what you've been working on and thank you so much for sharing um, your work with us um, I've also put your email in the chat for everyone so I hope that's okay thanks Pierre thanks a lot um, many thanks for the invitation thank you very much everyone see you next time bye, bye.